If I could have your attention, please. There's a, there are a few more uh, chairs here in front, some off to the side. If we could uh, have everybody take their seats, we'll get started. I'm David Yepsen, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute, and I want to welcome you to tonight's lecture by David Shribman, the Pulitzer Prize winner and editor of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. It's our first event of the 2013-2014 academic year, and I'm pleased my old friend made the trek to Southern Illinois to talk about politics and journalism. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements. First, I'd like to welcome the newest member of the Simon Institute staff. Is, where's Vanessa? Vanessa? Vanessa Sneed. Uh, <laughs> comes to us from what used to be ORTA, now the Office of Sponsored Projects Administration, and before that, Continuing Education. Uh, we're glad to have her with us. Uh, a few upcoming events this month. On September 23rd, uh, students and others who are interested in careers in the U.S. Foreign Service can meet uh, for coffee in our office at 9 a.m. with Ambassador Janice Jacobs. As many of you know, she is a Saluki, and she is now the Assistant Secretary of State for Consular Affairs, and she'll be uh, able to talk to people about career opportunities uh, at the State Department. She's going to give us a little of our time for a cup of coffee that morning. I think there's a flyer on the table if you are interested or know someone who might be. Please pass it along. Then on September 24th, from 4 to 6 p.m. in our lobby, the former Senator Alan Dixon will be doing a book signing. His book, The Gentleman from Illinois, is a wonderful collection of old war stories. Uh, you know, I'm reading this book, and... I wonder how did he ever get to be such a friend of Paul Simon's? Uh, because Dixon tells this wonderful story the night he was, the day he was slated by the East St. Louis machine to uh, be the candidate for, the Democratic candidate for state senator, and they celebrated by pulling out four glasses and a bottle of wild turkey. I can't ever imagine Paul Simon doing something like that. <laughs> But Dr. Jackson tells me that's because the two men had their followers, one in the reform movement, the other in party regulars, and they sort of legitimized one another and helped one another, Paul, he, Paul with, the, with the party regulars and, and Alan Dixon with the, uh, with the reformers. So it was an interesting uh, partnership, and uh, it's a great book. So I hope you can stop by and greet the senator and pick up a copy of the book. And then on September 25th at the Tech Center at the airport, uh, Former Congressman Jerry Costello will continue his series of lectures on his career in Congress. He'll be part of the Morton Kenny Lecture Series, and he'll be talking about the nation's infrastructure crisis. So I think that's a timely, uh, a be a timely talk. I also want to remind you of the documentary, WSIU's new documentary. It was produced by Jack Tickner. It's a wonderful film, and that will be airing on uh, October 24th. I had a copy, a few copies of the program guide that talks a little bit about uh, about the film, and uh, so I hope you'll be able to tune into that. And finally, we're going to be doing a major fundraising event this fall in celebration of Paul's 85th birthday. We've received a $50,000 challenge grant uh, from businessman Lester Crown, who's a great supporter of Paul's, and you'll be getting some mail from us about this. I hope you can be especially generous in your donations this year because we are trying to meet uh, a fifty thousand dollar challenge. I want to thank my old partner Matt Bauman for helping to arrange that and for helping us. Yeah, give him a hand. <laughs> Matt's okay, he still returns my calls. Um, if you're in Chicago on November 14th, we're having a reception and a movie showing that evening at the Union League Club uh, to help us raise that money. And now to introduce our guest and deliver the university's official welcome, I'd like to introduce our chancellor, Dr. Rita Chang. Chancellor. David looks a lot taller behind this podium, but uh, uh, thank you, David. It was uh, uh, great to learn all of, about the uh, September events that are happening uh, uh, at the Institute. David and his staff at the Institute do a wonderful job in helping us all to uh, better understand the complexities of the world in which we live, and I appreciate that uh, their focus is on also enhancing our students' educational experience since 
um, our students will then have the opportunity to address and hopefully resolve uh, some of the uh, global issues uh, in the future. Though it may be coincidental, the timing of uh, this uh, evening's presentation couldn't be better. Uh, with President Obama scheduled to address the nation uh, at 8 o'clock, and I've got it on, I used to say tape, like a DVR or whatever that thing is that's by my uh, TV, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, President Obama uh, addressing the situation in Syria, we certainly are seeing the intersection of foreign policy and uh, politics. Um, our speaker tonight, uh, David uh, Shribman, is a highly respected uh, political observer, and uh, I'm sure David uh, will have uh, some uh, thoughts and comments uh, to make about what's going on uh, in uh, Syria and uh, President Obama's uh, situation as well. David earned a Pulitzer Prize in 1995 for his coverage in Washington, D.C. and American politics, and so he's no stranger to uh, this type of situation. He's, he's served as a national political correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. He's also covered Congress and the national politics for the New York Times and was a national staff member of the Washington Star. David has been a regular contributor to the PBS show Washington Week, and so you may recognize him from that, and certainly a frequent uh, analyst uh, for both BBC and CBS. Now executive editor and vice president uh, of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, he still finds time to uh, write a nationally syndicated column called My Point each week. I enjoyed my brief conversation with David, and I know that you will also tonight. We're really pleased that he can share his insights, and uh, it's, it's great that the coincidence is that there's some really interesting things going on in the world right now. Please join me in welcoming David Shribman. Well, thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, David. I have a great, this is the first time I've been here, but in, even so, I have a great fondness for this university. I have two members of my staff, including the recently graduated Julia Rendleman, uh, who are uh, Salukis. Uh, perhaps the professor who marked me the most in my freshman year in college is a Saluki himself, Richard Winters, who just retired from the government department at Dartmouth College, where I was a student. And uh, I've uh, known Salukis my whole life, and I'm uh, delighted to be here. I do want to say, uh, before we get started, that um, don't get too confident about that National League Central Division race all of you Cardinal fans. My guess is that you'll lose the one game playoff and the uh, Pirates will end up playing Cincinnati uh, on our way to the World Series as we did recently in 1979. <laughs> Anyhow, let me tell you what we're going to do here. Um, we want to get out in time for the President's speech. Uh, and I don't want to shortchange you, which is why David so kindly started us a few minutes early. I'm going to give a prepared remark. I actually wrote something here. And then um, uh, you can either talk about that, or we can talk about the president, or presidents, or whatever you like. But I, I want to start off the, um, I said that this lecture would be the new architecture of American politics. And when David called me, he said, well, give me a title. I use that all the time, because you can talk about anything, even the pirates, <laughs> with that title. But I, I'm, I've, been, I've been really uh, preoccupied the last couple of months thinking about all these 50th anniversaries from 1963, and I'm comforted uh, in seeing that there is only one student here, um, so that all of you will remember 1963, and looking out upon you, some of you were actually 40 then. Um, uh, I said to David, uh, looking at this crowd, I said, this is my kind of crowd. It's the NPR crowd and the people who think the Dodgers are still in Brooklyn. Uh, anyhow, as I said before, the title of this lecture is The New Architecture of American Politics. And I plan on taking an unconventional look at the subject for the next several minutes. Let's see what we can learn about 2013 by examining the year 1963, which for me, and I suspect for all of you, no joking here, was a very important year. 
Why 1963, you're asking? Well, it was 50 years ago, a half century. And because we use the decimal system, that amount of time has significant and peculiar appeal to us. We have in this year, 2013, celebrated many 50-year anniversaries, most recently the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King and his March on Washington, which put the phrase, I have a dream, in our lexicon. And it may occur to you that we have another 50th anniversary, another sober one coming up on Sunday, the 50th anniversary of the bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where four young girls, uh, three of them 16 and one 14, uh, were killed. They would have been 64 and 66 this year. Also sometimes forgotten is that there were two other killings in Birmingham that year, that day of uh, young black people as well. And so two more months will reach another reason why the, why the four digits 1963 are so freighted with memory and with tragedy. Those digits are chiseled into history because of what happened during a split second in Dallas, Texas on an afternoon that delivered November 22 into infamy. This is not only the, it's not the only principal event of 1963, but surely the pivotal event of the entire decade of the 1960s and for many of us of a certain age, all of us here, and for many who followed, it may be the pivotal event of the last half century or more. It marked us like no other until the year 2001, and perhaps even more deeply than that year. There are several reasons to pause and remark upon our year of 1963. It was the year that Patsy Cline died in a plane crash, and Sylvia Plath died in an oven. It was the year Martin Luther King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail, and he delivered his speech from a Washington monument. It was the year James Bond movies began, and Project Mercury and the Studebaker line all ended. It was the year Lester Pearson, Alec Douglas Holm, and Jomo Kenyatta all became prime ministers. The year Giovanni Battista Montini became the pope. You know him as Pope Paul VI. It was the year I Want to Hold Your Hand was released and zip codes were introduced. In that year, a Buddhist monk set himself afire in Vietnam. Medgar Evers was murdered in his driveway. Frank Sinatra Jr. was kidnapped. An American nuclear submarine carrying 129 men sank. It was called the Thresher. The first diet drink, Coca-Cola called it Tab, was introduced. Sandy Koufax struck out 15 people in game one of the World Series against the Yankees. He was in the World Series because the St. Louis Cardinals were not. <laughs> Christine Keeler was arrested for perjury in the Profumo scandal. Kim Philby was given asylum in, the Soviet, in Soviet Russia after a British sky, spy scandal. And here in Carbondale, Carmen Picone was the head football coach. In 1963, the United States was more powerful than it had ever been, more powerful than any nation had ever been. Everything about it was big. Its nuclear arms, its popular culture, its colorful eccentricities, its peculiar weaknesses. It was a huge, powerful, and diverse nation. It was sending men to explore the new frontier of outer space. It was exploring its interior soul and wondering whether a nation conceived in liberty for all could continue to deny its blessings to some. It was involved in a cold struggle in Europe, especially in Berlin, and in hot struggles around the globe, especially in, Cong in Congo, Laos, and ominously a place called Vietnam. Its power was symbolized by the troops that sat at the ready, a rifle shot across tense borders in Eastern Europe, and on the Korean Peninsula. Its weakness was symbolized by the missiles that only a year earlier had been assembled a brief trajectory away in Cuba. Its promise was symbolized by the great wealth assembled in its cities and suburbs and harvested on its plains. But its great problems were symbolized by those in the city, suburb, and farm who were clawing to be invited in. A toxic mixture that would, in the decade to come, produce the sort of domestic turmoil and national introspection the nation had not known 
since the Great Depression. And so amid all this turmoil, it should not be surprising to learn that this was a year of new rights and of great wrongs. The new rights became early in the year, they became apparent, when Betty Friedan published The Feminist Mystique, and then in June, the first woman traveled into space. Back here on Earth, the Supreme Court handed down its famous Gideon versus Wainwright decision, assuring that all who were accused of crimes be provided with a lawyer. The country would never be the same again. But much of that was in the future. Let's look for a moment at America in 1963. As the year began, Robert Frost, William Carlos Williams, Ernie Davis, Pope John XXIII, Home Run Baker, Estes Kefauver, Edith Piaf, Aldous Huxley, Herman Lehman, Dinah Washington, Paul Hindemith, J.D. Tippett, Lee Harvey Oswald, John F. Kennedy, and Jack Ruby were all alive. By the end of the year, they were all dead. As the year began, the following had not been born. Charles Barkley, Michael Chabon, Johnny Depp, Michael Jordan, Carl Malone, Brad Pitt, Vanessa Williams. By the end of the year, every one of them would be alive, not walking on this earth, but preparing in the way that infants do to change the world. They'd be among the 189,241,798 Americans on this continent, only about 60% of the number who live here today. And it was a very, very different country. The average cost of a new home was $12,600. Today, the average cost here in the Midwest is about $150,000. You could buy two gallons of gasoline for about the same price as one gallon of milk. Two gallons of gasoline for the same price as a gallon of milk. A loaf of bread in 1963 cost half what a postage stamp costs today. And if you're wondering, you could mail a first class letter for four cents when the year began and five cents when it ended. A Hershey bar was a nickel. And for a generation of us, we'll always think that a Hershey bar should be a nickel. <laughs> the average wage was $4,397. And I can imagine a lot of you are thinking that that would be a lot of money in today's dollars. Well, you're wrong. The equivalent today is $31,420. The average household income today is at least 33 more than that, percent more than that, a reflection of our relative prosperity and, of course, of the movement of women into the workplace. And by the way, 1963 was the year that the Equal Pay Act was signed into law by President Kennedy. And so while you're figuring your relative economic status in 1963, let me remind you that your internet service, your cable fee, and your cell phone bill were a lot lower in 1963. <laughs> then again, the Dow was at 700. I haven't checked this afternoon, but I can say reliably that it's higher today. You could buy a blast shelter to save your family from a nuclear attack in 1963. Those are slightly harder to find today. Apples were 16 cents a pound in 1963. They're more than a dollar now. A pound of Colby cheese cost 39 cents. It would set you back $5.69 today. Ground beef was 49 cents a pound and it was all organic. Today, regular old ground chuck goes for about 3.48 a pound. You'd get a dozen sugar donuts for 49 cents in 1963. Your grandkids would think you're crazy if you walked into the house today with a dozen sugar donuts at any price. <laughs> a Motorola car radio would cost you about 40 bucks. And if you bought one, you could hear it play Sugar Shack, Surfing USA, He's So Fine, My Boyfriend's Back, Blowing in the Wind, and Mr. Obama's favorite, Walk Like a Man. Everyone in this audience knows those songs, along with I Will Follow Him, It's My Party, and Blame It, on the bossa nova. All of them were released in 1963, and I think we can all agree, none of them is out of style or ever will be. The Cardinals, as I mentioned, finished in second place where they belong. <laughs> Tick Grote was at shortstop. He's a Pittsburgher, by the way. Bill White batted 304 at first base. Ken Boyer was at third. Stan Musial was the star, but he only batted 255 that year. year. Another Pittsburgher, by the way. There was another St. Louis Cardinal team. There were more than one. They were the football team. They went 9-5 and five that year. The quarterback was Charlie Johnson. 
The split end was Sonny Randall. Television was in its hey heyday. You could buy a set for about a hundred bucks, which is pretty expensive when you think that a Swanson chicken TV dinner went for 39 cents. Now, if you sat at your TV table and tucked into one of those TV dinners, for me, I used to like the Salisbury steak, you might have watched General Hospital and Doctors, both of which premiered that year, or American Bandstand or Outer Limits, that began that year too, or even seen Donny Osmond sing on The Andy Williams Show. The Patty Duke Show in Petticoat Junction began that year. Johnny Carson was in his second year. Mr. Ed, Mr. Ed, Mike Douglas, <laughs> The Wonderful World of Color by Walt Disney, and the Fulton Sheen program were in their third season. Well, that's a pretty rich cultural life. You could hear Roy Orbison, Buddy Holly, and the Drifters. At the movies was Lawrence of Arabia and To Kill a Mockingbird in bookstores, and there still were bookstores, and I noticed you have one here in town, where John le Carre's The Spy Who Came In From the Cold, The Bell Jar, The Shoes of the Fisherman, and E.P. Thompson's landmark Making of the English Working Class. I didn't read that book till another 14 years had passed. It marked me deeply. Edward Hopper and Roy Lichtenstein were still painting. Andy Warhol created his painting of eight Elvises, as if one weren't enough. Benjamin Britten and Igor Stravinsky were still producing important classical musics, music, music works. Oliver, how to succeed in business without really trying, and a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, were in the theater. It was a very rich time. It was also a remarkable year for a disappearing art form, the speech. In fact, the year 1963, there were five remarkable speeches, a record for any peacetime year, especially when you consider the first three delivered within the space of one month. They were Vice President Lyndon Johnson's Memorial Day speech in Gettysburg, by far the least well-known. John Kennedy's American University peace speech, the President's speech in Berlin, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and finally President Johnson's address to a joint meeting of Congress shortly after President Kennedy's assassination. Though I or your parents or your professors may think of the assassination of Kennedy of having occurred in our own era. The birth rate today is half of what it was in 1963. The rate of birth to unmarried uh, teenage females is five times higher now than it was then. The average American home is 71% more expensive in constant dollars than it was in 63. The number of daily newspapers is down 21%. There are more than 95 million Americans today, today with connections to the internet which is 95 million more than had it in 1963, which was the year the mouse was invented. The first mouse was wooden. Consider this. When the Gallup organization asked Americans in 1963 whether relations between blacks and whites would always be a problem, 42% said yes, 55% said a solution would eventually be worked out. When the same question was asked five years ago, the answer was substantially the same. 38% saying it would always be a problem, 58% saying a solution would be found. But many more things have changed, some of them actually dramatically, in those nearly 50 years. And it's those changes that define the country we live in today. One of the major acts, areas of transformation, is religion. Those who reached adulthood in the 60s were twice as likely to attend weekly church services than those who reached adulthood in the 2000s. Those who attend services at least occasionally went down by 18% between the early 60s and our own decade. In 1963, almost two-thirds of Americans believed the Bible was the actual word of God. Less than a third of Americans believe that today. In 1963, about a quarter of Americans said they could vote for an atheist as president. Today, that rate is 54%. About two-thirds of Americans said that if their party nominated a qualified candidate who happened to be Jewish, they would vote for that person. Today, the figure is at more than 90%. In the year in which Kennedy died, about half of Americans said they could vote for a black presidential candidate. Today, Barack Obama is in his second term. Right now, about half of American adults are married. At the time of Kennedy's death, about three-quarters of Americans were married. No one asked poll questions about gay marriage in 1963, not only because the word gay didn't enter the mainstream until 1971, the first time a gay character was depicted on television. We all remember that night 
in all in the family. This year, according to the Washington Post ABC News poll, nearly three Americans in five support the right of gay and lesbian couples to wed, and 115,000 same-sex couples are rearing children right now. Then there is the transformed role of women. In 1963, only 20% of married women with children worked outside the home. Today, the rate is three times as big. Today's workforce is comprised of more than 10 times as many women as it was in 1914, 36% more than in 1963. Support among college freshmen for the legalization of marijuana has doubled since 1963. In 1963, about a quarter of Americans had attended college. Now, a majority of Americans have attended college. The nation's political profile has undergone dramatic change as well. In 1963, 48% of Americans identify themselves as Democrats. That's 48%. Today, only 34% do. The percent of Americans who consider themselves conservatives remains about the same, 51%. But trust in government, which is one of the major indicators of modern conservatism, is down from 76% to 30%. And it dropped precipitously this week, I'm sure. The rate of Americans who believe that quite a few government officials are crooked grew in 1963 from 29% to 50% now. The rate of divorce has doubled. In 1963, there were 18 arrests for drug abuse violations per 100,000 people. That's 18 per 100,000. Now the rate is 500 per 100,000 people, 28 times as large. About 40% of Americans smoked cigarettes in 1963, about 20% smoke today. One of the important cultural experiences of the 1960s, surely, was the Kennedy assassination and the television coverage of the weekend leading to the president's funeral the following Monday. Today, such shared television experiences are far more rare. In the year in which Kennedy died, 34.9% of Americans watched the show Beverly Hillbillies. In, 19, in 2013, no weekly show will hit the 10% figure. Charles Murray, the path-making conservative theorist, believes that sexual, gender, and civil rights revolutions were inevitable by the time of the Kennedy assassination, and that something resembling the war on poverty would probably have been proposed in 1964, no matter what. But in his influential 2012 book, Coming Apart, he argues that there has been, since the Kennedy assassination, the formation of classes that are different in kind and in their degree of separation from anything a nation has ever known. It's that world we live today. Almost everything is different in kind and degree from anything we knew and experienced in 1963. Too bad and hooray. Thank you. So that's kind of a portrait of where we are, and I thought I'd let the, we got about 30 more minutes, right David? I thought we'd let the rest of the evening be dominated by what you want to talk about, and I'll respond to your questions, and if they're especially good, I'll avoid them. But um, I'd like to hear your questions, and we can talk about the president, or about 1963, and I, um, I sense that for many of you, 63 was an important year, and that these 50-year 50, 50 anniversaries are particularly poignant for all of us. Uh, and so I'm happy to talk at a far greater length about that as well. David, I'll use my prerogative here as the moderator to open the questions. You've looked at the last 50 years, lots of change. Look ahead uh, and, and give us some forecasts on where you see American politics headed. Uh, we, all, we, we, we look at this incredible divisiveness uh, that exists, the lack of, of comedy, the worry of that we're not getting the same quality of public officials that uh, today that we had uh, maybe then. Could you comment on some of those things for well, me? Well, looking ahead just for one month, the Pirates World Series celebration, <laughs> looking beyond that. Uh, I th uh, on the way in, uh, Dave and I, Dave, Mr. Epson and I spent two and a half hours more actually this morning, this afternoon, driving back from St. Louis. And one of the things we did, which is what old guys sometimes do, is talk about how great the old days were and how the, these aren't as good as they were. And, you know, between the two of us, we covered every major.
political figure and every major scoundrel known to man. And, um, and we agreed wholeheartedly that they were better then. But I'm not sure, first of all, let me just, before I go to the future, let me talk about the is it better now or then question and then go to the future. I'm not sure things are, things are all that much worse now than they ever were. You know, um, women are in the workforce. 51 or 52 percent of the American population, the talent of those people was uh, by and large um, not exploited or um, uh, not advanced or explored uh, until recently. Uh, Ten percent of the country were, ensla- were, were the um, uh, descendants of enslaved people who didn't have opportunities that they have today. Um, we have today the uh, opportunity to look up in an instant who the 26th president was and who his running mate was, not that we'll remember either of them for more than six seconds. Um, We have a larger number of Americans in college, and this university is a symbol of that. Uh, Your freshman class here is larger than any freshman class in the history of this university. Um, There are more people with with graduate degrees. We have a greater standard of living. Those, Those are good things. Some of the things that aren't so great is American social mobility has been limited substantially. I think we're a less socially mobile country. Um, I worry, and many of the, prof- uh, the professors among us worry that the amount of general knowledge that young people have is significantly diminished, that the ability of young people to put in chronological order the Vietnam War and the um, uh, War of uh, 1812 is in serious doubt. Um, my wife uh, teaches in the English department of the university of Pittsburgh, and she says that her students know no grammar, have no general knowledge of anything, and are not willing to work very, very hard. Well, I don't know if you look back um, in the year 1908, Woodrow Wilson gave a speech. He was not, not yet the President of the United States, he was still the President of Princeton. Princeton at the time was a um, university that was that was less rigorous uh, than uh, than Southern Illinois University is today. Far less rigorous, far less socially progressive than SIU is today. Uh, far less diverse than SIU to- is today, and far less prestigious than SIU is today. Though none of you believe it, all those things is true are true. And he gave a speech, and he asked the following question. Given the state of education at Princeton today, or at American universities, would Abraham Lincoln have been a better president had he had a college degree? And the answer was not clearly yes. So surely we can say that our um, American education system, by and large, is better, though there are terrible um, black-white disparities and and terrible uh, disparities between rich and poor, among rich and poor, in the um, elementary and secondary levels. As for the future, you know, the future always looks dim. It looked awfully dim in 1933 when the President of the United States had to tell his people that the only thing they had to fear was fear itself, a statement even he didn't fully believe. Uh, In 1939 and through 1941, the prospects for democracy in the West were as dim as they have ever been. They're far brighter today. The level of education of members of Congress uh, was far lower. The uh, level of discourse in Congress was far less um, uh, mighty. um, uh, There were bribes on the House floor. The um, Daniel Webster, my own hero, um, lived across the street from the White House and accepted bribes from the railroads and from the banks. That doesn't happen quite as often, though it's not thoroughly unknown today. Um, And so looking ahead, I can't say that things are going to be worse or or, or than they are today. Surely that we'll live in a in a um, world where where um, where the United States is not the only superpower, something we've really but really been experienced only between 1945 and 1949 and then again between 1989 and say 2010 or so. Uh, China will be a much more important force. I worry about a resurgent Russia. Uh, I can't believe that uh, President Putin's initiative this week is entirely selfless. Um, In fact, I can't believe that President Putin has a selfless impulse 
in his body, and I worry for Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Romania, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and other places. Uh, and maybe that's someone who is too steep. Maybe it's because I'm too steeped in the lessons of 1938 and the experience of 1939 to 45. So there's an old story, David, uh, from, um, from Fiddler on the Roof, where uh, all these uh, guys in the shtetl are worried about what's going to happen. And they went up to the rabbi, and they'd say, Rabbi, Rabbi, what should we do? And he says, I'll tell you the truth. I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know. <laughs> yes, and I'll repeat your questions. Uh, you, yes, you, yes, sir. Yeah, you. There are only four of those, yeah. So that's a great question. So the question is, what's the state of the presidency today? It has ups and downs in the last 50 years. When it became imperial, then imperiled. And I think that, first of all, the president's um, you know, powers come and go. The President Roosevelt was an extremely powerful president, yet not so powerful that he was able to remake the, um, either the Supreme Court or the Democratic Party. Uh, president uh, Johnson was an extremely powerful uh, president until around 1966 or 67. Um, go through, we, we remember in our own time, many of us, um, uh, in, in, during the years 1977 um, uh, to 81 when Carter was president, when people said the presidency was too big a job for any one person and that there'll never be a, a two-term president again. It was followed swiftly by a two-term president who kind of had a third term with uh, George H.W. Bush, followed by another two-term president, followed by another two-term president, followed by another two-term president. So um, it's, it's easy to see peril ahead where it might not exist. It's easy to see um, you know, the presidency waxing and waning. We've seen in our own time or even in our own, in the five Obama years, uh, of a very strong president in the first year, and I would argue an exceedingly weak, if not imperiled or, or um, paralyzed president uh, today. Um, president Reagan had a good first year, a really lousy second year, um, re recovered a little bit, had, had a big scandal, then passed a big tax bill, you know, these things go up and down. I, I think, um, as many of you in the history department know, that history is descriptive and not proscriptive, that we can learn a lot about where we are from history, but we can't learn anything about where we're going. Um, that's the conviction of somebody who was a history major 150 years ago, me. And, uh, but I, I don't think that you can project these things. And it, we don't know who will be the next president, and we don't know what kind of um, challenges she'll face. And so, um, it's really impossible to, to, make, to prescribe this, except to say that the presidency reflects the character of the person who, who uh, occupies it. And as President Lincoln said, I found that I was less the master of events than the slave of events. I think I weasel out of that pretty safely. Yeah. So the question is, where are we going financially? And this, this, go ahead. So this woman, who was clearly passionate about this issue, actually asked a newspaper man for his perspective on the economy. And let me remind you that my paper lost $22 million, the Washington Post lost $58 million last year, and that we're the last people on earth you should ask about the economy, because we don't know anything about it. But I would say this, I would say this, 
there doesn't seem to be any will uh, or eagerness among the public to change Social Security substantially. Um, every, assure all of you in this room, that every single plan for changing Social Security refers to changing um, distributions to people who are under 55, which excludes 80% of us in this room, so we're all pretty safe. Uh, as, as for the future, I think we do have a huge financial crisis coming up, and it's one that we don't think about, but I think it's, it's ineluctable and unavoidable, and that is none, nobody my age has saved nearly enough for retirement. Don't forget, Social Security quite apart, because Social Security was designed as a supplement, not as a pension, a supplement. And if you go back and look at the original 1935 legislation, it was never regarded as a pension. But pensions in America are really are dead. I'm the editor of a newspaper, and I don't have a pension. Um, many, I can hear many of you saying, well, you don't deserve one. Um, uh, and and a, a lot of us have spent a lot of money sending our kids to college, and a lot of people have bought too many toys and haven't saved enough. And the average, I think the average savings of Americans is about $58,000. Now, that is not going to last a long time in retirement. So we are facing a crisis of the baby boomers' imminent retirement without nearly enough money put aside. And I have no idea what the political consequences of that are going to be, but they're going to be ugly. It's going to mean a lot of people at Walmart greeting people on their way in, but it's also going to mean a lot of poverty and a lot of, um, and even more of the generational drain from young people to old, because there were 75 million of us who were born between 1964 and 1946, the baby boom. And we have not saved enough, and we ought to be ter terrified about that as a nation and as, as individuals. Yes, sir. Well, you're not half as worried as I am. Um, uh, I think the future of journalism is quite uncertain uh, and quite perilous. Uh, none of us has figured out a model in which we can make it pay to have large numbers of highly trained and expensive reporters produce a news report that can at least break even. And uh, we thought as recently as a decade ago that the money would keep flowing in uh, from advertisers who wanted to be in our general interest newspapers. Well, and now we know that's not true. Um, we didn't even used to have to make telephone calls to get those ads. They just came in so much and we would turn ads away. Turn them away. That was the Wall Street Journal. We would tell half, not half, but many of these people, advertisers, oh, sorry, we don't have any room today. Um, in my own paper, on Thanksgiving, we would have 12-page Kaufman's Macy's ads. Um, I grew up in Boston. I remember those huge Thanksgiving papers with 8, 10, 12 Jordan Mar page Jordan Marsh and Filene's ads. Uh, Yonkers, other uh, Dillard's, other... Um, would advertise like mad. And they were the department stores and they really kept us alive. And when you think about it, a newspaper is a department store itself. It doesn't have ladies' foundations and uh, housewares, but it has a sports section, it has a living section, etc. The newspaper is, I think, the personification of the thing it kept, that kept it alive, the, the department store. And when was the last time you saw anyone under 18 in Macy's? I don't think it's happened a long time. Please don't tweet that or anything because they're still one of our big advertisers. And for the record, I, I love them dearly. Um, but I, th I think you know, you know so I, I don't know, the, it's another area where I don't know the answer, but I will say this. If we were sitting in the year 2013 and said, I want to invent a news operation, what you would not do, what you would not do is create um, something that required a paper that was delivered 
in trucks that were that was printed in petroleum byproducts and few and trucks fueled by gasoline to every home in the community you would not do that you would you would invent the internet um, by the same token say the internet were invented first and you had all this stuff and of course I have one here and you know that this this here has more power than the computers that were aboard Apollo 11 to the moon. But say you had just this, right? And I said to you, hey, I can give you something different. I mean, it's gonna have pages, you can turn, you can see lots of stuff on them, and color pictures, you can, you can take it to the bathroom, you can cut it out and put it on your refrigerator, and you say, geez, oh, we're gonna deliver that to your house too. I say, wow, that's a great invention. And so um, I think we'll be around, when you, when you turn it upside down, think of it that way, I think we'll be around for a while. Every one of you I know is on the internet and many, I'm looking just across this crowd and I know that 60% um, of you get a local newspaper and all I can say is I'm hoping they cure every disease and you guys live forever. <laughs> we have about two questions for about two more Dave, because you want to get everybody home for the speech. Oh, we have one over there. Thank you, sir. I believe you stated or inferred that in 1963, the United States was the most powerful nation in existence. If I remember that correctly, what is your judgment today, and if it's different, what difference does it make in the world? That's a really good question, because actually, sir, as I was reading that, having written it last week, I said to myself, I'm not sure that's true. Um, was the United States more powerful in 1963 than Germany was in 1939? Or that Britain was in 1859 or 1913? So I'm not sure that my premise was completely true, so I apologize to all of you. And I had second thoughts even as I read, read that sentence. But as to our own power now and into the future, um, uh, at the Pentagon they're worried to death about China. Um, with good reason. Uh, they're worried to, to death about uh, internet ter uh, terrorism. I don't mean blowing buildings up, I mean uh, disabling computers. Um, the letters um, EMP, do they mean anything to any of you? EMP? That, yes, anybody here say yes? Tell us what that is. Exactly. The EMP stands for electromagnetic pulse, which is a force that would basically disab disable our entire banking system, our entire health system, and even the website of the Post Gazette. Um, uh, as uh, indestructible as it may sometimes seem. And so they're worried about that. So power will be measured in different ways. The power of Britain uh, in the 18th and 19th century was measured by ships and by colonies, until colonies became regarded as, a, um, as an economic detriment and a burden rather than as a... Um, so power, I think, in the future will be measured by um, digital uh, ability, by robots, uh, by drones, uh, and by things we haven't even invented yet. Uh, because if we spoke about power in 1979, the end of the Carter years, you would not have mentioned uh, the internet you would not have mentioned Silicon Valley. Among America's attributes, you would not list um, uh, the garage uh, where so many of these things were invented. Um, Bill Gates uh, in 1979 um, was probably still at Harvard, about a year away from quitting. Uh, maybe it was a year one way or the other. So it's so hard to know what the th next things will be, but um, we won't, whatever they are, we will not dominate them completely. We don't have enough engineers in this country. I know you produce a lot of engineers here. Um, uh, water will be an issue. Uh, climate change will be an issue. Uh, women will be an issue. Um, and, uh, and the way we integrate our diversity and whether we make it diversity a strength or a weakness will be an issue. And none of those are the kind of issues you talked about in 1939 to fight Nazi Germany or 1914 to fight 
uh, Austria, Hungary, and uh, the uh, and the Central Powers, and so I think we're looking at much different kinds of ways to measure power, and uh, we'll have some of it, but not all of it. One more. Yes. Now here's the good question. Given the developments of the 24, last 24 hours, and being a model newsman, I have almost no idea what they were because I was in the car talking to David for most of the period. And um, if we were, if there wasn't so much BS flowing, we would have listened to the news. Um, but the question was, do I think that this will be enough to have diplomacy prevail over, um, over military action? A question, by the way, that could have been asked in September 1939, 38. Uh, but I think in this case, um, I think it probably, it very likely will. I th I'm guessing here because I don't know what's specifically what happened in the last couple of hours, but I think that's probably a great American distrust of Putin um, and a great American uh, feeling that it may be opportunistic for Putin and it may be some kind of a maneuver. And so I think American, the American leadership will be very uh, worried about that. But clearly there's no great appetite in America or in the Congress for military action against Syria, and so this might be an opportune way to weasel out of that. But I think we'll learn more in about 12 minutes. So I thank you all very, very much, and we'll talk to you. David, thank you very much for a, an interesting and thought-provoking uh, talk tonight. I appreciate you making the trek from Pittsburgh to Carbondale, and uh, we'll see you in Bush Stadium. Um, <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming as well. As is our normal practice, David will hang around a little bit uh, after tonight's lecture if you have other questions or comments that you'd, uh, you'd like to share with him. And I will, we are going to adjourn just here uh, uh, very quickly because I do know some of you want to uh, be able to hear the president's talk. I'm told that the television downstairs is uh, tuned to ABC. Presumably the networks go to live to a president still when, when they are giving a, a speech about war. So if you want to slip downstairs, you, uh, I'm sure the students will, will share some of their space. Thank you all for coming. We're adjourned.